I am not Jamie Metzl. <laughs> uh, my name is Walt Everett. I'm chair of uh, seminars at Steamboat. And I want to wish you all a very warm welcome to our 21st season of seminars at Steamboat. Today, we begin the 2023 season with a series of five prescient, nonpartisan public policy presentations that range from emerging technologies to the environment, social justice, and international affairs. Your presence here reflects a firm commitment to staying informed and engaged in critical discussions, and we thank you for that. In our rapidly evolving world, informed and thoughtful discussions are crucial. We are also, they also shed light on key issues. They express opinions and they empower you to advance civic disclosure and discussion. Our lineup of expert speakers brings fresh perspectives, challenging our thinking and inspiring our actions. Seminars at Steamboat thanks you and it thrives on your engagement. Ask questions share insights, and reflections on different perspectives. Immediately following this evening's presentation, there will be a Q&A session, I think most of you know that, with the speaker that will include questions that you can submit at any time using the social apps, uh, social Q&A. Just go to uh, joinqa.com, enter code 85518, or scan the QR code on the back of your program. The seminar's board members express our deep gratitude to all of our sponsors and to our volunteers and to all of you who made this, series, this season possible. Your support enables us to bring impactful presentations year after year and all at no cost of admission. We especially recognize today's seminar sponsor, Bell Sawhill. And today's supporting sponsor, the Yampa Valley Bank. And now to introduce this evening's speaker and moderate the Q&A session, is Seminars board member Jane Stein and co-founder as well of Seminars. Jane. Well, it's good to open up the season of 2023. From gene editing crops to make them more productive, to controlling malaria-carrying mosquitoes, to actually designing or redesigning human beings, Biotechnology is poised to shape the future of our lives, and this is just the beginning. Mutations are no longer random. They are being designed. Painful, life-threatening diseases can be gene genetically rewired, and people can lead normal lives. As good as this sounds to some, it is questionable and even unacceptable to others. Are we dealing with an evolution of biotech or a revolution, as the title of tonight's seminar suggests. What can be regulated and how? Jamie Metzl, a leading expert in biotechnology, will lead us through this, this maze of issues and what it means to us. He is uniquely qualified to do so. 
He has been a member of the World Health Organization's Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing and the founder of One Shared World to meet common global threats. In his spare time, which he finds somehow or other, Jamie is an Ironman triathlete and an ultramarathoner and took a long run today. His book, Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity, makes for fascinating and provocative reading. Off the Beaten Path will be selling books and he will sign them after the seminar. Please welcome Jamie Metzl. Thank you, Jane. And thanks so much to all of you, and thank you, so I can be able to wander around. And I'm just thrilled to be here in your beautiful town. It's just so gorgeous. Uh, my parents have a place in Vail, and so I was a little biased until I got here, and it's, I can see on your face, don't even mention that word, but it's just a loving, friendly place, and that you're all here today is, is really a great, a great pleasure and an honor for me. Um, and I'm here for one, two reasons. The first reason is I really had absolutely no choice. Uh, last year, I got an email from somebody saying that they're with, they're with the Steamboat Seminars and they wanted me to come and things are really busy and I'm finishing my next book and I kind of responded, thank you, but it's really hard. My, my schedule is crazy. And then I got another message and it was just so kind and loving. And then I got another message and another message. Um, and every message, I mean, I'm, as my girlfriend Malika, who's here, will, will attest, um, my whole philosophy is loving harassment. If there's something that should happen in the world, uh, the people who need to do it should know that the path of least resistance is just doing that thing. And eventually, when you get loved and loved and loved and loved, you get to the point of realizing that the path of least resistance is just doing the right thing. And so I had so much loving outreach from Jane and Belle and Marianne, and they started to, to describe this speaker series and how it's a community-based um, speaker series and everybody pitches in and it's free to the participants. And I had in my mind um, that it was like the Amish people building a barn and everybody was pitching in. And then I thought, like, if somebody's ringing that bell, am I really going to be the guy who, who goes the other way? So that's why I'm here. And really, kudos to you for sustaining, a, as just as a community, a, a speaker series like this. The second reason that I'm here is that this is just such an incredible moment in, essentially, in human history, in, this, in the, the experience of humans on planet Earth with such profound implications for every aspect of our lives that for me in the work that I, that I do and in communicating with audience, uh, audiences like you through speaking and my books and my other outreach, I just feel very passionate about bringing people into that conversation and doing my little bit to try to frame the big picture implications of this moment and then what it means for all of us Within our, within our lives. And so that's my, what I'd like to do in our, in our time together today is talk about, well, what is the essential nature of this moment? Why is this moment so unique in the, in the, the annals of, uh, of human history? What does it mean? What are the real uh, world applications of these technological revolutions that we are experiencing? And then what are the implications for us individually and collectively on a local and a communal and even on, on a global scale? And then, and then I'll be look forward to answering and giving my thoughts on your questions and, and hearing from uh, you about your perspective. So maybe we can start um, talking about just this moment in history. By a show of hands, how many of you have heard of ChatGPT? Just raise your hands. OK, great. Pretty much everybody. How many of you have played around with ChatGPT in one way or another? Raise your hands. All right, so a good number of all of you. And ChatGPT, it's pretty incredible. I mean, you can give it these prompts, and you can say, write a poem about this, or tell me about, about that, and it's, it, it comes back, and it's actually really impressive, and it is. Um, but the story of AI is not that ChatGPT 
is going to give us a cooler and better equivalent of Google search. The story of AI is that AI is going to be infused into everything else. So if I asked you to tell me how electricity has influenced your life today, how would you think about that, answering that question? You could say, well, I, all right, so I woke up, um, but I was in a house that has air conditioning. And then I woke up with an alarm. Uh, and then um, I had uh, to get here, I came in a car. And I guess I live here because electricity has made living here possible. When you start thinking about all the ways that electricity has influenced your life, you realize that electricity isn't just one thing. Electricity is a piece of pretty much everything. And that's the case. That's what AI is. I mean, ChatGPT, in a few years, maybe we'll remember the name, maybe we won't. But artificial intelligence, which I think even then it's, it's a wrong term. It's not artificial intelligence. Like it's, artificial means it's non-human, it's fake human intelligence. It's not that. It's just machine intelligence. It's another form of intelligence, just like dolphins don't have artificial intelligence. They have dolphin intelligence. Machines have and will have machine intelligence, and maybe someday machine superintelligence. And it, the question won't be, is it just like a human? We don't ask that question about dogs or dolphins. It'll be, what is the nature of this unique intelligence what, how is it different from our evolved, embodied intelligence? And then how do we interact, uh, how do we interact with each other? So let me, let me park that idea to the side for, for a moment and then come back to this point of the big picture implications of where we are. Because the story of now is not the story of any one technology. It's not the story of any three or four technologies, it's the story of how our human communities are organized. It's the story of the greatest power in, the, in our world being unleashed, and that power is human intelligence. So we can take a step back. A hundred years ago, uh, the world population was about two billion people with a 15% literacy rate. So that meant that there were about 300 million people who had the capacity to participate in the world of knowledge shared beyond their immediate communities. I mean, there were other ways of communicating, but literacy was a way of sharing, in particularly generation to generation, but across communities, accrued knowledge. Today, we have a bit more than 8 billion people we have an 85% literacy rate. So that means we have nearly 7 billion people who have access to the world of shared knowledge. Just that alone is transformative. But we're also networked to one another. And what that means is that anybody who comes up with an idea anywhere can share that idea with everyone everywhere. So maybe you remember from when you were in school learning about the Bronze Age and the Copper Age and the Iron Age and all of these ages, and we learned that these ages showed up in different geographies, in some cases thousands of years apart. There would be one part um, maybe in the Mediterranean basis where they came, ba basin where they came up with the recipe for copper, and it could have been two, 3,000 years later that, uh, that that recipe showed up here or in other parts, other geographies ar around the world, and also with vice versa, with technologies like corn. And so what does that mean? Well, it, it means that for, let's say it's 3,000 years, people in the Americas don't have the ability to experiment with copper, to come up with, with creative innovations, creative ways that copper could be used to do other things, and then to share the benefits of their creativity with others around the world. So from the perspective of figuring out cool stuff to do with copper, you could say that 3,000 years 
were kind of wasted here in the Americas. And you could also say that from the perspective of having readily available calories through corn, um, 3,000, more than 3,000 years were wasted in, in the old world. But now, we don't live that way anymore. Anybody who comes up with an, an innovation regarding anything immediately shares that knowledge. And that means that every single person wakes up every morning, and remember, it's 8 billion, not 2 billion, wakes up every morning solving a problem that has never before been solved. So we had 100 years ago, 300 million people solving, redundantly solving problems that had already been solved. So that alone, again, is just an incredible unleashing. And then on top of that, we have our incredible technologies. And we have names for technologies. Uh, that we, we think of uh, computer technologies and AI and nanotech and biotech. Um, but those are all shorthands. Really, there's just one thing that is technology, because all of these technologies inspire other technologies and are inspired by those technologies. It's kind of like nature. Like when you go to a university, and you're walking around, and you say, oh, this is the chemistry building, this is the biology building, this is the physics building. Nature doesn't know the difference between chemistry, biology, and physics. That's our shorthand. In nature, there's just nature. And it's the same thing with technology. There's just technology. It's one thing. And it's growing exponentially because all of the technologies inspire each other. And this is just a, 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 a small, very miniature example, but we have computer technology. And with computer technology, we're able to have the AI revolution. And with the computerization and AI revolution, we're able to in interrogate complex biological systems that have evol evolved over around 3.8 billion years that there's been life on Earth. And with that ability, we're able to uncover patterns in biology that, that we can then use to create better, more efficient computer chips, that, and it's a, this cycle of innovation. We can use patterns of biology to think about strategies for artificial intelligence. So I'm sure you all have heard of neural network computing. And neural network means building on biological models. So you have all of these technologies that are, inspire, that are inspiring each other. And that's when you hear about exponential change. That's what it means. It's an acceleration of change because technology begets technology. The more technology you have, the greater your capacity, not just to do cool things with what you have, but to come up with even greater things. And this is really difficult uh, for us humans because our, our brains have evolved for very practical thinking. Our brains have evolved on the, the, in the savannas of Africa so when you hear with your friend and you hear a rustle in the grass and your friend, the idealist, is looking up at the sky, looking at birds and thinking birds fly, maybe someday humans can fly, what are the physics of flight? And your ancestors, I promise you, were the people who said, oh, S-H hyphen T, I heard a rustle in the grass. That could be a saber-toothed tiger. I'm out of here. And so across generations, the saber-toothed tiger ate that dreamer and your ancestors were the guys who got out of there. That's how our brains function. Our brains are not built to think exponentially. When you open the refrigerator in the morning, our brains do not say, hey, get ready. What you see in the refrigerator this morning could be fundamentally different from what you saw in the refrigerator before you went to bed last night. It's, it's efficiency. It's how we've evolved. Um, but right now, the big question is, what if, for now, the saber-toothed tiger ate the wrong guy? The liability now is being overly practical. And the evolutionary imperative is really thinking big, really opening your mind to what is possible and to what could be possible. And that's actually, it's a really fundamental shift. I mean, one of the reasons why I also write science fiction is I mean, for readers, but also for myself, to kind of force myself 
out of the, the inherent conservatism of my brain, and I think all of our brains, just because that's how our, our brains have, have been designed to function. And so we can really look at any technology and we'll see this shift, this shift into overdrive of te technological innovation. But because we're so focused on AI and because AI is a step change, kind of like domestication of crops and industrialization and electrification, I think it's worth spending a little bit of time on the AI revolution and what that, and what that means. And I'll start in 2016. So in 2016, um, there was a computer program, an, an AI algorithm called AlphaGo. And AlphaGo was developed by a company in London called DeepMind. Uh, then it became Google DeepMind when Google acquired it. And they created an AI algorithm uh, that was competing against the world's greatest Go champions. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the game of Go, um, but so the game of Go, move per move, is many, many times more complex than chess. And so with Deep Blue and the victory over Garry Kasparov, that was just crunching the numbers. But to win at Go, it required more than just crunching the numbers, something that was more equivalent to thinking. And that was why people had said that defeating the Go algorithm um, would take many decades, if ever. And in 2016, AlphaGo beat, at that time, the world champion, uh, Lee Sedol, in four, uh, four games out of five in Seoul. And it was this shifting moment where people said, wait, wow, wait a second. Um, this is something very significant is, is happening. But in a way, it wasn't as big of a victory as it seemed because the training set that the AlphaGo algorithm used was all of the digitized games of Go. So Lee Si Dole was one guy playing Go, and AlphaGo, in some ways, represented all of the Go masters who had played all of these games. And so in some ways, it wasn't a fair, a fair fight. Here's Malika. Um, it wasn't a fair fight. The next year, there was what seemed like it would be a fair fight. AlphaGo, the algorithm that in 2016 had beat Lee Sedol, versus the new algorithm created by DeepMind, which was called AlphaZero. And AlphaZero, they didn't feed it any of the digitized games of Go. What they fed AlphaZero was, were the rules of the game of Go with the instruction to play, a to play against itself and with a, a, a reward mechanism for when it made moves that increased the likelihood that it would ultimately win the game. So AlphaZero started playing, and it wasn't very good in the first hour, and then it got a little bit better, and it got a little bit better, and how many days do you think it took before AlphaZero, training itself in this way, um, defeated AlphaGo, which the year before had defeated the world's greatest Go master. How long do you think it took? Four days. Four days. In four days, it became, on its own, the greatest Go master in all of history. So that's 2017. 2018, DeepMind said, well, we're not in the, the business of gaming. We're in the business of trying to develop what they called artificial general intelligence to solve real problems. So now, we're going to use these technologies to solve one of the toughest problems in biology. And that problem is protein folding. I'll just a little bit of a quick science. I know that there are, are scientists um, in, this, in this audience, um, but the, the, the workhorses of biology are proteins. Uh, in our cells, the, our genomes have the code, the recipe, and then the, the, the genetic information is passed using messenger RNAs from inside the egg yolk, the nucleus, to the egg white, and that's where the proteins are created. And now, with the beginning of genome sequencing, we're able to sequence those proteins, and then you get a string of letters representing the 20 amino acids. And so that's huge. To, to be able to sequence proteins is really, it was a really big advance. But the issue is, 
proteins are, to understand what a, how a protein is going to function, you have to understand both the sequence and the shape. And so being able to predict protein shapes from the sequence of letters, it's called the, the protein folding problem, and it's been one of the biggest challenges in all of biology for many, many decades. And so uh, there is a, a biannual competition where different teams are, giving, are given these strings of amino acids and given the task of predicting what the proteins will look like shape-wise from these strings of amino acids. And the way that they can do that is there's the traditional way of understanding this, which is using uh, X-ray crystallography, and it takes about three years to sequence a single protein. And there are about 220 million proteins known to science. So if you do it the old-fashioned way, if it's three years times 220 million, 660 million years is what it would take, and lots of postdocs and lots of PhDs are about, about doing this, matching the shape and the sequence for a single amino acid. So AlphaFold, which is this new algorithm, they entered into this competition in 2018. They came in a, a disappointing 20th place. That's 2018. They went back, they, re, they rejiggered the algorithm, uh, worked hard. In 2020, they came back. And not only did they win, but they won so resoundingly that Nature magazine declared that the protein folding problem, meaning the ability to predict the shapes of proteins from their sequenced amino acids, had been solved. So this was like a huge, huge thing, really, really big. The next year, 2021, they, the DeepMind uh, released the predictions for 350,000 proteins. So 350,000, so that's um, times the, the three years, a million years of, of uh, saved time. And that was a really big deal because it was all of the proteins that make up the human body, huge, very practical benefits for healthcare, for drug discovery, for industrial production of, of industrial materials through synthetic biology. The following year, which is 2022, last year, DeepMind released the sequence genomes uh, and, the, and the shape predictions for 215 million proteins. So 215 million times three years that's 645 million years thrown back into the pot. Remember I said about having the recipe for copper all on the same day? So we get this extra time, 645 million years of extra human time for the most talented people to come up with new innovations. And then each one of those innovations is on this, uses this same kind of model because the more we invent, the more we create, the more we share our inventions and creations, the more empowered other people are to use that as their starting point. So now, forever, every biologist, when they show up in the lab in their morning, their starting point is understand, is having uh, uh, predicted shapes for all known proteins. So this, this is why, I think, as I said before, the real power here, it's not any one technology, it's the unleashing, it's this combination of human innovation and creativity with tools that are in many ways beyond our imagination. And just as an asterisk here on this point, your entire lives are beyond the imagination of your ancestors. Our nomadic ancestors, not so long ago, the, the whole story of your life was to just search for food all the time so you wouldn't starve to death. I mean, the thought that we could have Safeway and, and, and Starbucks and just live these, these lives, it would just be unimaginable to our, to our ancestors. So we always are living unimaginable lives relative to our ancestors. But right now, things are speeding up in a really deep and, and profound way. And I think that, that, in my mind, that is, is this kind of essential point and as I said before, it's not just about AI. AI is just one piece. AI is part of everything else. 
and all of these technologies are inspiring each other. So then that leads to the second part of what I wanted to discuss with you today, which are the applications. And that is really where the, the rubber hits the road for us. Um, so certainly something that's very important to us humans is biology. So my, my new book, it's called The Great Biohack, Recasting Life in an Age of Revolutionary Technology. It's coming out next year. Uh, but it's all about this. It's all about what the intersecting AI, genetics, and biotechnology revolutions <clears throat> mean for the future of life. And many of us, when we think about this, and, and Jane referenced this in her, her introductory remarks, we think there's going to be some moment where somebody says, hey, should we genetically engineer ourselves and our entire future, or should we not? And then we'll do a show of hands, and people say, yeah, maybe, maybe not, and then, and then we'll decide. But that's not how it's going to happen. Nobody asked our ancestors whether they wanted to, to domesticate plants. It was just somebody was a nomad, and the first person came up or found <coughs> a, a domesticated plant variety, and they planted it, and they made a few whatever it was, and that was pretty good. And while they were running around chasing animals, uh, and then maybe their kid did it a little bit more, and their kid did, there was never a referendum, should we domesticate plants and animals or not? It was just a bunch of very logical decisions that didn't even seem like decisions. And that, that's where, how our future is going to unfold, and that's how our future is unfolding exactly now. Because healthcare, uh, you know, people think that, as Jane mentioned, it's going to be, should we genetically engineer our future kids or not? And I have a, a book that I've written about that. Um, but that's not the question. The question is just going to be, in a bunch of very practical ways, should we do this next little thing where not doing it will seem dangerous? So let me talk a little bit about, about our health care. Right now, we live in a world of generalized health care based on population averages. When you go to your physician, um, in most cases, but not all cases, you are treated because you are a human being. That there's more alike between us than there is difference. And so for most things, if you go to, to Walgreens and you get a Tylenol, it's because somebody has come to the conclusion that Tylenol helps most of us for headaches, and it's true. There's a tiny percentage of us who will die from Tylenol, and in our world of generalized medicine, we find out who those people are when they call 911. It's, I mean, it sounds funny, but that's, that's, it's a great way. It's better than everything that we've done in the past. Um, in most cancer treatments, when people say, we're going to start you on this thing, may help, may kill you, may do nothing. If it, if it helps, we'll stick with it. If it doesn't kill you and does nothing, then we'll start you on the next thing. It's just that we don't know. Humans are very complex beings, and we have some things that tend to work on humans, and we do a lot of informed trial and error. That's generalized medicine. We're now, as you all know, uh, moving towards our world of personalized or precision medicine and healthcare, where you're not treated based solely because you are you with, you're a human with an N of 8 billion, but because you are you with an N of 1. So how do we know who you are? Because we need to have a lot more information than we have if you, we're treating you based on you. So sure, we need family history and personal medical history and biometric information and all of the, the metabolic and other tests that everybody gets when we go into the hospital. But we need more information. We need information on a molecular level. And that's why people are starting to have, for example, their whole genome sequenced uh, as part of your electronic uh, health records. And, and just raise your hand. I think it'll just be very few if you've had your whole genome sequenced. Very few. How about if you've had your genome sequenced in any way, meaning you've sent a mouth swab to 23andMe or Ancestry or, or anything? So that's more. But it's all... And, and right now, one of the reasons why we don't uh, get our whole genome sequenced is it's been expensive. The first whole human genome uh, cost about $2.7 billion, and it took about 13 years to do with the Human Genome Project, which culminated in 2003. Now it takes a few hours, and it's, it's starting to cost around $100. So $100. So we're all going to have our whole genome sequenced, and that's going to be just as part of your electronic health record, and when your, your physician, and, and a physician practicing alone will be malpractice, 
and AI practicing alone will be malpracticed. The only way for healthcare, quality healthcare, to work will be humans plus AIs working together, because no human can understand the complexity of human biology on their own. It's just way, orders of magnitude beyond our, the capacity of our, of our brains, as great as they are. And so we're entering into this world where we're going to have all of this information. And if you just have one person's G,、uh, sequence genome, it doesn't really mean anything. Because what we need to do is understand the complexity of human genomes relative to other people. And so, because understanding complex human biology exists in the context of what it means to be a human, we're going to need, and we're already starting to get millions and ultimately billions of people's genetic and systems biology information, because we're not just genetics, our bodies are a system of systems. Set in the context of dynamic environments around us. And the more that we can measure, the more that we will put this information in these big data, databases and data sets, and that's already starting to happen, the more that we're going to be able to mine that information to understand patterns and to understand what the individual patterns of a, person biolog a person's biology mean for them. And so that's this shift from generalized to precision. But then there's another shift that we're going to relatively quickly make, and that is precision to predictive healthcare. Right now, what we call healthcare isn't healthcare, it's systems based sick care. That you have a symptom, you show up in your doctor's office with this symptom. If it's a genetic disorder, this symptom most likely. Is something that began the roots of this symptom. The symptom, even if you're 75 when you get to your doctor's office, the roots of that symptom was, was the moment when your biological father's sperm、um, fertilized your biological mother's egg. That's when it started. It didn't show up in, as a symptom for you until 75 years later. And when this thing has already shown up 75 years later, it's actually really hard. To treat. But the more data we have, the more that we're going to realize, and this is also a theological point, that, that there's a lot more that is predictable within ranges of human biology and human experience than we know now. And one of the easy ways is just going to be to understand ranges of risk and ranges of opportunity. We are not genetically predetermined beings. But a lot of our capacities exist within a range of possibility. I mean, there is a reason why I will not win the 100 meter sprint in the Olympics, and it's not the distance from my home to my school. We all have different sets of capabilities, and that exists in our healthcare as well, in our health as well. And so, what predictive and preventive health will be is say, all right, well, here is your range of possibility. How do we make sure that you live a life toward the top of your, the range of your potential? And how do we address risks that, are, that you are at higher risk for certain things? How do we address that head on and get ahead of that curve? So, for example, if you have a child that has an increased genetic risk for Type 2 diabetes or a genetic form of breast cancer, I know it scares people to say that you're going to be at the hospital with your newborn and get a risk report saying that your newborn child has all of these risks. But parents are going to demand it. I mean, if you have a child that has an increased genetic risk of developing type 2 diabetes, you're going to really put a lot of attention into instilling diet and exercise habits as a young child. And if you have A daughter who has an increased risk、um, for a genetic form of breast cancer, you're for sure going to want her to get screenings when she's 20 and not wait until 40, which would otherwise be the norm. So we're going to demand this kind of, of information for, for good reason. I won't go into just for this talk, but all of the other applications of preventive and,、uh, and preventive healthcare, maybe we can talk about it in, in the, the QA. Like gene therapies, which, which will 
at least for certain indications, revolutionize how we think about healthcare. There's huge innovations in um, personalized um, cancer vaccines uh, based on understanding the biology of your unique tumor, not your category of tumors, your exact tumor, and sequence it and target it with, with very quickly. But that's a little bit technical, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over that. So what will it mean uh, to have these massive data sets? What will it mean to increasingly unlock what feel like secrets of being human? Not just in the realm of healthcare, but in the realm of everything. Because our health and healthcare are just a, per, a, per, a tiny percentage of our biology. Our biology, um, yes, it's designed to keep us healthy at least until we procreate in a little while longer. Uh, but there's a lot of things. The, the survival, the history of our species is embedded in our biology. And as we unlock these secrets, things that have seemed like magic, like chance, are increasingly going to become choice. And that will transform a lot of different areas of how we function. But certainly, how humans reproduce will be one of them. Humans are a sexually reproducing species, as you may know. Um, but we're sexually reproducing species for a reason, um, because sexual reproduction versus cloning and other earlier forms of, of reproduction that bacteria and other early life forms used has a tougher time uh, generating diversity. And diversity equals resilience. The Darwinian formula is random mutation plus natural selection is the way that, that, that different species survive and thrive when they, when they win at that game. And so the more diversity you have, the better your odds of being able to adapt to change as it happens. There's no good and bad in evolution. There's just better or worse suited for a particular environment. When that environment changes, then some, you could have been really well suited for the old thing. Um, but if you don't have diverse members of your community ready for the new thing, you're going to be in trouble. So we now, humans, are unlocking some of these secrets, and it's going to show up everywhere, as I was mentioning, but human reproduction is one of those areas. And the way that we're going to do it is we're going to shift from sexual reproduction with sex as the primary uh, mechanism for, for creating, driving sexual reproduction, to sexual reproduction with science as the driver. You're all familiar with Louise Brown. Uh, it's now been uh, my age, minus 10, 45 years since Louise Brown uh, was born. And in those days, IVF was shocking. It was condemned by the Catholic Church. Uh, now it's, it, it's so well accepted that even the most right-wing anti-abortion um, uh, uh, activists tend to carve out IVF in the laws in the most restrictive states because it's been so normalized. And why do I think that more and more people are going to have children using in vitro fertilization and then embryo selection? So the way you would do embryo selection is you have IVF, you grow the, the, um, uh, the fertilized eggs in vitro in the lab for about five days, um, then you extract a few cells from each, you sequence those cells, and because we have all of this knowledge, as we've discussed, about the complexity of human biology, um, you're able to understand not everything about these potential future children, but some things. And even today, let's say you have 10 embryos in a, in a lab, and you do this process, you can roughly rank order them likely tallest to likely shortest. There's a lot of work being done on anything, but anything that has a genetic foundation, very controversially, possibly IQ, certainly eye color. I mean, there are a lot of human traits that we see as just the magic of random chance that are going to become choices. And the reason why we're going to want to do this is that nature has an error rate. I mean, we feel it's an error rate. It's just how biology functions. And so when anybody has a child who's born with a deadly genetic disorder, that's just biology functioning. I talked about random mutation. That's what it is. It's not that, that biology is trying to make every mutation a good one. It's randomly generating mutations. From our perspective, it's better to not have a child who dies from a genetic disorder 
when they are young. And that's why we have healthcare. That's we have, why we have all of these interventions. So if we say we can use this science and these capabilities to make it so somebody having a child doesn't have a child that's going to die of a deadly genetic disorder, I think a lot of people are going to want to do that. If once the error rate of science is lower than the error rate of nature. We still have a ways to go for that, but that's, it's a really important point. And so once we're doing that, once we're selecting, well, then the question is, well, what do we select for? And where can we go just with the process of embryo selection? Well, we already know the answer to that. Raise your hand if you have a dog. Yeah, raise your hand if you, if you eat eggs. <laughs> So your dog used to be a wolf. How did it stop becoming a wolf and become your chihuahua? It was over 20 plus thousand years of humans making these choices on behalf of these animals. How did a wild egg laying one egg a month become the domesticated egg, the domesticated, I'm sorry, wild chicken laying one egg a month become the domesticated chicken that laid the eggs that, that I know Malika had for breakfast uh, this morning. It was through this same process of selection. And we're going to be, have the capacity to do that for us, um, provide that we say, oh, well, here are the things that we're selecting for. And there's a real danger because, as I said before, there's no good and bad in evolution. And if everyone says, well, I want a, a tall kid with a high IQ and big muscles or whatever, ask the dinosaurs, 66.1 million years ago, what do you want for your kids? They'd say, oh, I want muscles and claws and a roar and all that. And it turned out that after the asteroid hit, it was better to be a cockroach. Or like our ancestors, who were these little, tiny, shrew-like mammals who could just, we were burrow because we were essentially prey. So we had to be hiding all the time. And it turned out that hiders and animals in water and a few ones that could fly into caves, those were the ones who survived. So there's no good and bad in evolution, but our species is suddenly, suddenly now for the first time in all of history, all of the history of life, we suddenly have the increasing ability to read, write, and hack the code of life. The question for us is what does that mean? And it's not just about human life, it's about all of life. So agriculture, Plant and animal agriculture is about 10,000 years old. It's fundamentally transformed the way that we're organized, uh, the way that we live. Uh, we're all here because of plant and animal agriculture. If we were all nomads, we wouldn't have 8 billion people. Um, and now we have the increasing ability to push our agriculture in new ways, and we have to do it. Because the reason we went, I said 2 billion to 8 billion over the last 100 years, why do we have it? It's because of of advances in agriculture. It's the green revolution in the, the developing world. It's the application of, of modern fertilizers using the Haber-Bosch method for fixing nitrogen in soils. It, that was the time bomb of humans. So now we have this agriculture um, that we can scale, because right now we're at 8 billion. We're going up by some estimates to around 10.4 uh, billion people at the end of this century. If we scale current agricultural practices as is, for that, we're going to wipe out the entire planet, cut down all the forests, and have massive increases to climate change. So we can't do it the way that we're, that we're doing it. So what are the other ways that we can think about it? Well, one is we need to make our agriculture, our plant agriculture, more productive using our biotechnology. And when I'm with healthy people like you, and I say, we need to apply biotechnology to crops. A lot of people say, well, I don't want uh, biotechnology in my crops. I only eat um, organic, sustainable. What's the name of the, of the health market on, on the main street? What's the name of that place? Well, everybody said it at the same time. Whatever you said at the same time, that place. I'm going to go to that place, which is called... Um, I'm going to go to that place, and I'm going to get organic, sustainable. And if you ask me, well, what's the word after organic, sustainable? For everything that you buy, it, organic, sustainable, biotechnology. The, the, the farmers in Peru growing quinoa using their 
ancient seeds passed down by their ancestors are radical biotechnologists. The difference between the crops that they are growing and what preceded domesticated agriculture is thousands of times more than the difference between that and GMO crops using seeds created by Monsanto, now a subsidiary of Bayer. It, this is a tiny, tiny step. Agriculture is biotechnology, and if we want to feed 10.4 billion people without destroying the planet, we have to do a lot of things. Uh, but one of those things is we have to increase the productivity of our agriculture, and biotechnology is part of that. If we want to use for synthetic fertilizers, which we do, which have an enormous implication for climate change, not to mention the, the runoffs going into places like the Gulf of Mexico, creating these terrible dead zones, we're going to have to think about uh, differently about fertilizer. And these technologies are ways of doing that, of understanding the complexity of the microbiome, just like everybody here, I'm sure, is thinking about taking probiotics for your gut health. There's a soil health. There's a relationship between plants and the soils that help these plants grow. And so rather than using synthetic uh, chemical fertilizers, can we, in a, in a way, hack the complex um, ecosystems of both the microorganisms lining the plants and in the soils to increase the productivity? Uh, animal agriculture, right now, uh, again, everything is, these are the technologies that are really wonderful that have allowed us to go to these 8 billion people. But animal agriculture right now, land animals alone, we're killing and consuming 72 billion per year. Uh, and those numbers are going up. And with all of the, the veganism and vegetarianism, they're going up everywhere, very rapidly in the developing world, and also very rapidly on a per capita basis here. And so if we just continue as we are in three quarters of plant agriculture, in one way or another, goes to feed domesticated animals. So yes, everybody should be a vegetarian. It's not going to happen anytime soon. We also need to think differently about how do we secure our proteins. And so certainly, plant-based uh, plant proteins like the Impossible Burger are one way of thinking about that. But another way of thinking about that is, well, can we get the meat and the animal products that we want not grown in the bioreactor of a sentient animal? And I know that you all love animals, but if you're eating if you're eating any of these animal products, we're not treating these animals as like our favorite pets. I mean, we are, we are treating them like a means to an alternate end of our consumption. And so if we're already treating them that way, why don't we, if we can, if we can scale it, why don't we just grow the animal products in industrial bioreactors, which again, it sounds scary, but if the product is, on a bi is biologically exactly the same, as the, the meat product that you would buy in, in that market down the street, like, why not? And especially for ground meat products, which is 50% of all of the meat that's consumed is ground, where people, it, it's part of, of, of something else. I think this is a good idea. Uh, industrial materials. We all live in a world, everything here is dug up or cut down. And it's allowed us to have these lives that we have uh, but it, again, it's not sustainable. Just to keep the, on the path that we're on, we're going to have to cut down all of our, of our forests, dig up everything, uh, and we have to find better ways. And the tools of biotechnology allow us to grow the resources that we need rather than extract them through, through cutting and digging. I could go on in all of these examples. Uh, um, energy, uh, biofuels. Are, you actually, you'll, if you're flying United, you'll see little ads for, for biofuels on the on the screen behind the seats. Um, data storage. Uh, DNA, as you all know, is a much better storage mechanism for data than silicon. It's a million times denser. Silicon lasts a few decades, and it needs to be basically copied over. Um, our data storage centers use a huge amount of energy. Uh, but DNA can store data for up to 5 million years under the right conditions. It's harder to extract it. Um, but None of us, I mean, we are all beneficiaries of cultural inheritance. None of us could figure out anything on our own, let, how to make a pencil, how to make a paperclip, but we are all beneficiaries of this cultural inheritance. It's the foundation of our lives, and we need to be able to store it, especially as more of us are making more of it. So DNA is a part of all that. And all of this 
as I mentioned before, racing forward all of the technologies inspiring other technologies and everything rapidly accelerating. And it's accelerating because we live in a world of cultural differences within societies and between societies and competition between these different societies. So things are really racing forward and it's going to be very, very difficult to slow things down. And we aren't going to want to slow things down in, in many ways because the benefits of this are so huge that we're going to want those benefits. At the same time, as you're all very well aware, there are very significant dangers associated with all of these technologies. We can't be Pollyannish. And if it's uh, the technologies of the life sciences, we're interfering with very complex systems that we don't understand very well. I talked about the benefits of diversity and the importance of diversity. And if we if we interfere with systems that we don't understand and reduce our diversity, even the name of doing something good, that could create huge dangers. Um, uh, with the AI technologies, there's all kinds of ways of uh, introducing biases, of relying on systems that may have values and goals that are misaligned with ours. And so we live in this world where these incredible technologies are creating the most magical desirable advances that we want, and they are at the same time creating very significant dangers. And the final point is, what do then do we do to optimize the good stuff and minimize the bad stuff? And there's no easy answer to that question, but it has to happen on every level. On an individual level, uh, we talk about 8, million, 8 billion people. 8 billion people is a bunch of yous. It's a bunch of people making individual decisions, so it's incumbent upon all of you to really try your best to understand what's happening, to understand the decisions that you can make that align best with your values. And whether it's your purchasing decisions, your healthcare decisions, the conversations that you have, the communities that you're associated with, that's, that's really uh, important. On a national level, uh, we, this, what we're talking about is the future of life. It's the future of civilization, and it must be regulated. It has to be regulated wisely. It shouldn't be overregulated. Um, but there are some people who say, well, let's just let these systems unloose, uh, loose. The stakes are way too high. We must have wise regulation. And to do that, we need elected officials and government officials who are hearing from people like you about, well, what are the values that you believe should guide these technologies? Because no technologies come with their own built-in value systems. It's up to us, each and all of us, to infuse our societies with those values that will guide how these various systems will, will play out. And the final thing is, um, it's, this is a, a big one, but on an international level and a global level, uh, we have our species has reached, we now have a global reach, but we don't have a system for solving global problems. And this mismatch is really dangerous. And that's why we have individual people saying, all right, I'm working on climate change, I'm working on, on uh, the dangers of AI, I'm working on pandemics. And none of them can solve these challenges all for the same reason. And that reason is we're not organized to solve global problems. And we've had step changes in how we're organized after the 30 years war in the 17th century to create the modern nation state, after the second world war to create the UN. Now we need to do it again. And there are two ways that we're going to do it. One is after a, a worse cataclysm than COVID-19 where billions of people die, or we can start now and to say, why, right, how can we better organize ourselves before that crisis? And I maybe can talk about it uh, in Q&A or, or up there, but that's what our one shared world is trying to do, although we're a tiny little voice in the wilderness. But the most important thing is for all of you to recognize that this is a transitional point for being a human. And it's, it's so big that it can, it can sometimes, I know, feel a little bit overwhelming. But that overwhelming thing, it's just where things are. And it means that you all have a responsibility to do your little bit. And little bit by little bit, I think together we have an opportunity to build a better future. So thank you very much. Well, next.
now comes the fun part yep. of the Q&As. And yep. some chairs are going to come in a minute. Genetically engineered yep. chairs. <laughs> Can you give me my gate, right? Um, well, a lot of questions have been coming in, and what I'm going to start with is, what's the most compelling argument for having one's entire genome sequenced? The possibility for discrimination seems high, and I'm adding, is this, could this lead to a new form of eugenics? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll start with the negatives, because the fears about everybody having their whole genome sequenced are real. Uh, we live in a, in a world where this is critically important information. The regulatory infrastructure that we have to protect that, your genetic information is not as strong as it should be. We have the, the uh, GINA, which is the, the, basically the Genetics Privacy Protection Act, but it doesn't apply, for example, to life insurance and health insurance. So there are all, there are all of these little loopholes. Actually, life insurance, it does apply to health insurance. Um, and so there's a reason to be concerned. The reason why I have done it and why I encourage people uh, to do it is that there's actionable information. And so if there is information about whether it's a risk that you carry or, or whether if you're going and getting uh, some kind of, let's say, a medication and you have a genetic indicator showing that you are at increased risk for that, I think it's, it's really important. Uh, Malik and I we're, we're um, talking at lunch today about, well, what does predictive health care mean in the context of cancer? Maybe some of you have heard about this uh, company called Grail that does liquid biopsies. And so basically, if you have a, uh, a cancer cell, like a tumor that's growing, even if it's small, it starts shedding genetic materials into your bloodstream. And so what the Grail test does is it, it tests for trace elements of 50 different cancers. And again, it's a cancer that hasn't shown up, but I think having that information is, is empowering. And then the people, what people ask me uh, is, well, if I'm going to do it, what's the best way to do it? And so I'm on the, the advisory board for Robert Greene's uh, Predictive Genomics Center at Harvard Medical School. And I think they do a really, a, a really nice job because it's not just the information, it's information, it's the analytics. Um, and I, the broader point is shifting from symptoms-based um, sick care to preventive health care. When I visit Malika's family in India, I go to the, to the hospital where Malika's dad works, and I get a whole preventive health checkup. It takes all morning. They have these little helpers. They run you from room to room, maybe 50 different tests, and then you come back and you get a thing this big, and it's not, it's not that you have a symptom, but I think it's much better to get ahead of this curve. With the genetically targeted, as you say, cancer yeah. treatments as well as others, um, will this lead to further disparities in healthcare, especially as it relates to both access and payment? So if we keep our highly discriminatory, unfair, biased <laughs> healthcare system as it is, and, yeah, and we just layer in really cool, expensive technologies that are going to save the lives of a small number of people, that will undoubtedly happen. But if we recognize, as I think we should, that the goal of a healthcare system is to optimize the health of an entire population, it'll, it'll help us think differently. Yes, we need to have this cool stuff because it will trickle down, just like iPhones at first went to, to wealthy people. But if the goal is optimizing the health of the population, the smartest investments that we can make will be supporting the most vulnerable people. And we know how to do that because we don't need 21st technology. We need all the public health interventions, um, everything that we've learned over the last 100 years and, and more. So I think that we need to really think of these two things. It's not an either or, but if we're just allocating our resources towards the really cool expensive cutting edge stuff and we aren't focusing on population health, I think that will, will come back to bite us. How has the COVID pandemic changed the way we think or ways we should think about biotechnology? So it's huge and it's been a hype cycle. So in the beginning, um, people were really afraid. I gave a talk in, in the earliest days of the pandemic and I'll answer your question and, and a broader one. Um, and it was the question that I was asked was, is, are the tools of biotechnology 
a match for COVID-19? And my answer then was, the tools of biotechnology are absolutely a match for COVID-19, and that's been borne out by the, the absolutely incredible vaccines. But COVID-19 isn't the problem. That if we solve, use our technology, and we solve for COVID-19, and we haven't solved for pandemics, and you can't solve for pandemics with biotechnology alone, then that's a loss. And the way you would solve for pandemics is you realize that we're only as strong as the weakest links among us. So if there's some country in wherever Africa or Latin America uh, that has a terrible health infrastructure, and the, vaccine, and the virus is able to grow and mutate in those places, we are as vulnerable as, as anybody else. So our health resides in those people. And even if we should miraculously solve for pandemics, but we don't solve for climate change or nuclear weapons uh, or autonomous killer robots or all these other existential risks, it will be a, a, each one will be a pyrrhic victory. And so just like now we're investing in a universal flu vaccine, and the idea was if you every year make a new flu vaccine to address and to the, what's anticipated as this year's strain, you're going to be doing it forever. The idea of a universal flu vaccine is to say, well, what is the common element of all of these flu viruses that we're afraid of, and how do we create a vaccine to target that? And so that's why, for me, when I talked at the end of my remarks about our need for a, a global operating system upgrade, that's what it means. We don't have the ability to solve global problems. And so in addition to addressing individual manifestations of our global collective action problems forever, let's think about, well, how do we solve for the, the global collective action problem itself based around the, the, the principles of, of one shared world, and, but it's basically if the key word of the, the peace of Westphalia in the mid, middle of the 17th century was national, the modern nation state, and the key word of 1945 in San Francisco was international, the key word of now, if our species is to survive and thrive, is interdependence. That we need to build a, a we need to upgrade our global operating system based around the mutual responsibilities of our global interdependence. I agree with that, but we live here in the United States, and mm -hmm. one of the questions is, technology moves fast, governments move slow. Yes. What's the appropriate structure for managing technology, biotechnology um, policy? And which particular, I'm combining some yeah. questions here, which particular agency or agencies do you see taking a, a role here? Yeah, so it's, a, it's an essential point. Uh, the technology moves at an exponential rate. Uh, uh, public awareness moves at a linear rate and governance and regulation inches forward at a glacial rate. And this mismatch, it's, it's always been an issue, but now the technology is moving, moving so quickly. So in, in big picture, we really need to think about values because the regulators will always be behind the technologies. And when the regulators try to get ahead of the technologies like they do in Europe more than they do here, more often than not, they actually kill the technology. So it's not coincidental right. that the best biotech and AI and computer companies are all here. It has to do with the governance and, and, and regulatory systems. But we really need to think about values. What are the core values that should apply everywhere? And I talked about issues of diversity and equity, and we have to, to articulate uh, those things. Um, but that doesn't mean that in specific areas, we don't need more powerful regulators. So now in the context of AI, a number of people are saying, well, we need an equivalent. And, and Bob, Jane's husband, um, was involved with IAEA for a number of years, and so the, the, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and they did a pretty decent job, it's all breaking down now, but they did a pre pretty decent job for a while of containing the proliferation of, of nuclear weapons. And so there are some people who are saying, well, we need an IAEA for biotechnology and an IAEA um, for AI, and maybe we do, uh, but I think the first step is going to say, well, what are our values and what are the new powers that our existing regulators need to have? Because as I said before, there's an unlimited number of these kinds of challenges, and if we create a whole new infrastructure for each one, we're going to drown in all these separate entities where we need to say, well, what's, what's the common element? What's the universal flu vaccine that applies to everything? And then what is unique about each cluster of technologies that will require its own capacity? Um, in your book, um, you talk about unintended um, consequences 
there's an excellent example that you give of um, one thing can lead to another down the pike. Getting rid of sickle cell anemia in an individual could lead to an increase in that person getting malaria. Getting rid of the malaria carrying a mosquito could change the ecosystem in a particular country. Yeah. What are some other examples of unintended consequences? Life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, life. We Crossing have, the yeah, street. <laughs> yeah. No, so everything that we do is unintended consequences. And, and I, I actually, I write about it in, in, in the new book. Mm -hmm. And it's like, people say, well, there's a slippery slope. You know, if we edit one genome, we're going to recast humanity. Um, and yes, there's a slippery slope, but not all slippery slopes are bad slippery slopes. Like ask somebody on a date, you may end up married to them. Eat one little chocolate, you may end up eating the whole box, and that'll be, that'll be great. Um, so all, all of life is unintended consequences. And, and again, I think that what we need to do is say, well, what are our values? And then we just, we need to do a better job of understanding the ecosystems and frankly, respecting the ecosystems in which we operate. We are a meddling species. That's why we're here. We're meddlers and we're hubristic meddlers. And the entire history of our species is meddling with systems that we didn't even understand. And with all of our science, we're doing it now and there will be massive unintended consequences, but that's the world. But what we can do is to say, well, what are the values that are guiding us? And how do, we, how do we think about diversity? And diversity is something that's been baked into biology for 3.8 billion years. And now we're going to have to internalize that for ourselves and make choices based on our understanding of diversity. And if we don't sufficiently respect diversity, we have the potential of extincting our species based on people acting with really great intentions. Um, and so that, that's... And, and understanding the complexity of ecosystems and having more, as much humility as we can have as a species that is just designed to not have huge amounts of humility. Um, when, if ever, do you think you will be able, we will be able to edit the DNA in utero in such a way as to eliminate harmful sequences? In other words, not by, through selection. Yeah, now. But in utero, now. Now, yeah, so, so the basic, um, that, that already exists. Um, so the basic thing is for every disorder that we're going to have and future generations will have, there'll be, uh, there'll be a question of when is the most appropriate and most efficient time to intervene. And so the argument for intervening in the pre-implanted embryo stage is that if you fix a problem then, that fix, if you do it well, could be replicated across that whole being. And so it's probably cheaper and it could be better. There'll be, right now, there's fetal surgeries, um, but they'll need to be more targeted because the way it works, when you start, you're a single fertilized egg. And then as you grow, the, your, your cells begin to differentiate. And so that's why you have skin cells and heart cells and, and all the different types of cells that you have. So it's just like, it's like a, a, a river growing into tributaries. And so in, the, in, in utero, that differentiation has already begun to happen. Uh, but if you have a specific target um, and you're able to do some kind of gene therapy, then that may be a, a useful place. There may be interventions that are best made in infancy. And then there may be things where the risk of intervening in these earlier stages of life are, are so great relative to the harm that you're trying to prevent that you say, well, let's wait. It may be the best case scenario to wait those 75 years until something, until something shows up. But I think that the goal in my mind is to be able to have the most efficient intervention at the most appropriate time. What is the most startling thing, startling, that you have seen AI do? It's hard for me to answer that <laughs> question because it's like, if I said, well, what's the most startling thing that you've seen electricity do? It's like yeah. there's AI as its own thing, and there's AI helping other things happen. And so, in a way, it's like everything that I've described to you today, it is AI. It will increasingly be AI. So it's not just, that's why I was made, made the point in the beginning, it's not just a cool Google search. It's you have a cancer treatment, 
And I mean, my father, as, as Jay knows, is, is, the case, uh, is the case in point. He's, he is uh, being treated for cancer now, and he's on his fourth, uh, the, the, it was, they, they used the kind of trial and error mode, which is normal for oncology. And at number four, there were two choices. One was a traditional chemotherapy that had very harsh side effects. Um, so we knew that was, my, my father's 88. Um, and it only works in 30% of the time. And the other was a genetics-based targeted agent that had been approved by the FDA three months before we, we faced this, this question. And so the oncologist was suggesting that we go with the chemo because it was tried and true. And what I said is, well, if we go with the chemo, we know it's going to be really harsh on my dad, and my goal is quality of life. And we know Definitely. that with that as a given, it still only has a 30% chance of success. And my dad, a type 2 diabetic who's 88, what are the chances that he's going to be one, of, one of, those, of those 30%? But this targeted agent, which is based on the genetic analysis of his individual, his particular cancer cells, his particular tumor, um, which they said, it, it pro we think it has a 30-ish percent, but nobody knows because there were only... 40 people in the entire literature who'd had his type of cancer, neuroendocrine cancer, who'd been treated with this. And so I said, I want to do that because maybe it'll work 0% and maybe it'll work 100%. We just don't know. And, and he did it and it's been extremely successful. And he was like, oh, there was nothing in the literature suggesting that someone of his background could have this kind of, of positive response. So it's very good news. Yeah, no, so but. <laughs> So the, the point is we're, we're entering this new era and it, it's not that this is magic. I mean, there's magic stuff, but we still have to rely on the blocking and tackling of generalized medicine, of public health, population health. These are the things that are going to, to keep us safe. But there's new treatments and, and new ways of thinking about doing incredible things that I think are gonna continually blow people's minds. This is a question kind of bringing in your international yeah. interest. It says, China leads the world in cancer and cancer immuno immuno immunotherapy. Yes. How does global politics play into innovation here? You know, so I'll, I'll start, as some of you may know, I've been one of the leaders for three and a half plus years uh, of efforts to raise questions about the origins of COVID-19, which I believe by far most likely uh, results from a research-related, an accidental research-related incident in, in Wuhan. I think that's by far the most likely thing. And so I've been condemned by the Chinese government for that. And I'm very, very public saying Chinese scientists are doing, and Hu Jiankui, the guy who did the first CRISPR babies, he was a, a Chinese scientist doing very unethical work. Um, but in lots of areas, plant and animal agriculture, immunotherapy, there's tons of really great work that's happening in China. And so uh, in my view is we need to encourage that. Um, we need to have the scientific collaboration, uh, but we need to recognize that politics is everything. And that's one of the problems. Actually, there are hearings uh, tomorrow morning of the, the House COVID Select Committee. I was the lead witness in their first hearing, which happened in March, and the second hearing is happening tomorrow. And uh, there are a lot of questions about the response by uh, Dr. Fauci and by a small number of Western virologists in the early days who privately, in their private communications, were saying, hey, this looks like it could be an engineered virus, but then publicly, at roughly the same time, were saying there's mm -hmm. no chance this was. And I think that one of the reasons why that happened is that these were people who had invested decades of their lives based on a, a, a theory of the case, that we have these global challenges, whether it's pandemics or health or public health, and scientific collaboration across borders is the smartest investment that we can make in building that safer future. And it was really hard to see, to imagine that those scientific collaborations could have played a role in causing the worst pandemic in a century. And so in my mind, we need to recognize that any that science exists within a political context, everywhere. In China, radically so. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have scientific collaborations with China. It doesn't mean we shouldn't um, benefit from Chinese science. It doesn't mean we shouldn't invest in Chinese science. But 
people who say, let science be science and politics be politics, there is not a single scientist who is working in a, in a high-profile scientific area in science who isn't thinking about politics every single day, who isn't organizing what they say and what they don't say around science, who isn't functioning in a lab where how the lab functions is based around, around politics. And I just think that not being honest about that puts us at risk. One of, the, one of your monikers is as a futurist. <laughs> And this is your last question. Yes. Looking into your magical global globe. Oh, no, I left it at home. It's in New York. Well, you still have to answer <laughs> it. What do you see as the best and the worst outcome for the new biotechnology? Start with the worst, so we yeah. end up with an upper. <laughs> well, the worst is that we wipe ourselves out. Um, <laughs> well. And it's like... At least, it, at least we're in a nice place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you stay here while it happens. So um, every technology comes with its upside and its downside. I talked about the domestication of, uh, of plants and animals. If someone had gone to our ancestors and said, all right, here's the good news, is we're going to domesticate plants and animals, rather than chasing around the animals and you can just stay where you are and your chances of starving are going to go down. And on top of that, you can have specialization of labor, you can have cities, and you can have literacy, you can have civilization, you can have all of these, these things. But the downside is with these same capabilities, you're going to be able to have world wars and nuclear war and climate change. How would you even make that, that choice? So, it's, so these technologies could be abused. You could have easily have synthetic biology um, engineered pathogens killing billions of people. Uh, you could have gene drives. So gene drives are when you insert, essentially, the, the tools of genome editing into the, the sexual process of fast reproducing species. So you could do that, let's just say hypothetically, uh, to try to eliminate the mosquitoes carrying malaria, but something goes wrong, and you wipe out all of the mosquitoes because these things can pass very rapidly, and because some of these mosquitoes are foundational to ecosystems, then you have ecosystem collapses. So they're Really, you could just imagine forever the downsides. But you can also imagine forever the upsides. And I mentioned some of them. Creating a more sustainable planet, creating enough food to feed 10 billion, uh, 10 billion people, uh, developing medical treatments and, and other treatments, having unlimited sources of energy, being able to store the cultural inheritance of humanity for millions of years so we have an, an insurance policy. And I think that's in my mind, maybe to, to close up, it's, it's the essential point. Like if you hear the things that I'm saying and you're only excited, you should be excited some, but if you're only excited, you're missing it. And if you hear the things that I'm saying and you're only terrified, you're missing it. <laughs> because the story is that our species is gaining these incredible superpowers, powers that past generations have attributed to our various gods. And the future of our species will be determined based on we can, as quickly as possible, generate the ability to use these powers wisely. And when I say we, as I said before, it's eight billion yous and me's. And that's why what I see, the reason why I'm here and why I think you're here is not to entertain, although I hope I've been entertaining. Um, but it's to say that there's really big stuff happening. And if we want to increase the odds of these better things, it's up to us to make that happen. Well, let's all try and give Jamie a good thank you. Really good. Thank you.